Hello everyone and welcome to your Glassnode on-chain report for week 41. I'm your host Checkmate and we're here on the 12th of October 2021. So this week the market has really held onto the gains and traded in a very uh, tight consolidation range and actually at the time of recording has broken up and hit $57,000. So what we're looking at this week is the underlying fundamentals that are really continuing to paint a very bullish picture. Um, Bitcoin is looking extraordinarily strong and the hodling behavior, the accumulation uh, that we're seeing by long-term holders really is still uh, showing very, very positive and healthy trends. So what we're going to look at is a little bit of a view on the on-chain activity. We're starting to get a bit of an uptick, which is showing that some of the interest is returning to the market after a fairly quiet period. We're seeing this impressive growth in long-term holder supply really continuing. We're going to look at the magnitude of that accumulation. We're going to use the workbench tool to really look at this in a fairly unique light uh, to understand how much accumulation is going on relative to coin issuance. And then we're also going to look at one potential headwind risk, which is the rising leverage. So as prices rise, people like to take on more and more long contracts and uh, you know bet in size that the market is going in one direction. That can create somewhat of a risk that we're going to get some kind of flush. So we'll just look at some of those different details and uh, really explore the market from many different angles. So here we are in the week on chain dashboard 41. And what we've really seen is this week, Bitcoin really traded in a very tight consolidation raise. Let's actually bring this into the three monthly chart. You can see we've almost been in this stair-stepping pattern where it's really forming off this uh, very low bottom here at 40,000. We had our initial low at 29,000, a rally through all of August and into September. We had a fairly bloody September that really closed down here at this 40,000 level where we can see that many of these hodlers stepped in and really accumulated that level, which we covered in previous week's reports. And we've essentially had a springboard higher from there. So we've seen a fairly tight consolidation range between somewhere around 40, uh, 53,000 and uh, 56,500. And uh, we've actually broken out to about 57,000 at the time of recording. So overall, a fairly healthy market structure. Now, what remains quite interesting, we can see that price has obviously performed quite well over, the, uh, over October so far. However, note that on our on-chain activity, we're looking at the number of active addresses and the number of active entities. We've got a seven day moving average applied here just to smooth out the daily noise. And what I really wanna highlight is just how relatively quiet this actually is. We're getting a little bit of an uptick. So we're seeing that slight increase uh, on a seven day basis in both our entities and our active addresses, which is a healthy sign, but it's certainly a long way below where we were in Q1 2021 and late 2020. So through most of the actual full scale bull market, we had substantially higher activity and we just don't have that yet, which is quite interesting. It's really showing and it actually aligns with metrics like Google Trends and just general search interest in the asset that we still are in this fairly quiet period where a lot of the um, the attention hasn't quite come back in yet. And we can see this in the on-chain data. So that's looking at the activity, addresses and entities. We can also see a similar pattern in the number of transactions. We can see it's climbing, but it's still not quite back at the same levels we had during the, uh, the bullish period. So there is still some activity to go, but it's good to see that we're starting to get this flowing in. Now, what is an interesting metric, if we look at, we've got three metrics here. So that was looking at kind of activity, transactions, addresses, entities. Now we're looking at the amount of value that's moving on chain. So the median value created in UTXOs. So for every coin that's essentially moving and creating those UTXOs, what is the typical size in BTC that's in each of those transactions? Now, for those who aren't familiar, a median is kind of a middle value. It describes a typical value, the most common. So where if you look at averages, if you look at the mean, it can tell you a lot of information, but it will be heavily weighted towards people who are moving very, very large uh, volumes. You may not need many of them, but the average is gonna be lifted by large volumes. When we're looking at the median, we're looking at the typical behavior. What's the most common? What's the middle of the road? What is the most likely um, size of these UTXOs that are being created? Now, we can also look at that median transfer volume. So very similar. What is the amount of value that's being sent priced in BTC? And then we've got our entity adjusted basis. Now, there's something that I really want to highlight here. So if we look at our activity metrics, let's look at this over the last five months. We had um, a kind of a, a baselining pattern or a, a constant rate in our transactions, a slight decline as we formed our topping pattern. Same for active entities. We had a slight decline in the number of activity, even though we were forming this topping pattern. So in, in other words, that's a bit of a bearish divergence. We're seeing price going sideways, but we're not seeing more people coming in. We're not seeing the increase in activity that you would like to see. So that's a bearish divergence. 
We then had our significant sell-off in May and note that our number of active entities really did collapse. The number of active addresses collapsed and it really continued to fall as price traded. Even though the floor was somewhere around that 30,000, 29,000 level, every time we retested it, there were fewer and fewer entities. So there's fewer people actually initiating transactions, moving coins around. However, Note that the exact opposite trend is present in our median transfer volume, entity adjusted and median value of UTXOs. So during that same basing pattern, so when we had a topping pattern, we actually had declining value. And what's that telling us? More people or a declining number of people and they're moving smaller value. Very much that retail, almost late people who are late to the party, seeing it in the headlines and coming in kind of at the end of a trend. What we saw after our May sell-off, however, we had a 50% correction in prices, valuation started to get a little bit more attractive, and the typical value, the most common value, actually started to rise in BTC terms. We can see this in our median value of UTXO, see this little mountain that corresponds with our decrease in price, more value per dollar, larger size is being accumulated. This is actually a telltale sign of accumulation going on by fairly large buyers because we're seeing the typical value actually climbed quite substantially. So fewer people, larger typical transaction size, it's telling you big money, smart money accumulators actually stepped in during this period of time. So what we're seeing at the moment is that our median values actually declined somewhat. And we're seeing this tick, tick down a little bit. So potentially that's saying that we're getting more of these retail level investors coming in. However, we're also seeing an uptick in on-chain activity. So what that's really telling me is that we've got a large amount of buyers who came in at this 30,000 level. We then know that they stepped back in um, up here at this 40,000 level. And now that they've essentially got large parts of their position, we're now starting to see the on-chain activity. Price has risen, it's starting to bring people back in. And it's really speaking to what could be similar to the end of a bear market. We've seen this fairly bearish correction period. And now we're seeing people starting to flow back into the market. And it's this cyclical behavior that we tend to see play out over time. So this is just an interesting balance between the on-chain activity, the typical transaction size. We're also seeing transaction volumes up quite substantially recently. So we're still seeing a large amount of value moving around. And bear in mind, you can have with the median value, you can have a median value that's declining, but you can still have large volume moving. It just means that there's been overwhelmed. There's more of these smaller holders coming in that are a little bit more excited by the rising price and you know starting to show up in headlines. So there's a lot of human psychology baked into much of this, uh, this on-chain data in the way that people behave. So now we're gonna move on and look into the long-term holder supply. Now, this is a very interesting metric. Long-term holder supply is describing coins that are around five months, 155 days or thereabouts, and they've been hodled for that period of time, or that particular wallet or that entity happens to have that same heuristic where they essentially buy coins and they're not spending them anytime soon. And what we've seen is this very dramatic climb. You can see that we had distribution. So when we're seeing a decline in long-term holder supply, which we can see in our six to 12 months of um, coins as well. So we see this decline, which is distribution, coins being sold or spent. They transfer from long-term holders to short-term holders. Now, what we saw is that bottom out sometime in April, and then we started to see it really rocket higher. And what that's telling us is that those long-term holders or those short-term holders are becoming long-term holders. The coins that were accumulated during the first phase of this bull market, and increasingly, five months ago, we were actually down here in May, starting to move into this consolidation pattern. People who essentially accumulated their coins throughout the bull market in 2021 are essentially still holding a great number of those coins. And this is actually at all-time highs now. We're up over 13.3 million coins. So we're seeing a very, very large amount of this volume and particularly note how it's starting to include these six to 12 month coins. So remember this is 12 months ago. We were back here in, uh, in late 2020, September, or October. And this is really where the bull market started to hit. So we're gonna start seeing coins that have been held for more than 12 months actually start migrating out of this age bracket and into the one year to two year band. So we're starting to see this very, very strong maturation flowing between these different age bands and they're starting to get quite old, uh, quite interestingly. Now, what we're also gonna do is jump across to our workbench chart. So this was included in the week on chain newsletter. And this is a, an example of how we can kind of map 
out just the magnitude. How big is this long-term holder accumulation? So let's turn off some of these charts and we'll look at it one by one. So we have our circulating supply. And remember that all coins in the circulating supply were mined at some point in time. At the moment, it's roughly around 900 coins per day. So if we then look at our long-term holder supply, we can see that the long-term holder supply in blue is starting to grow over time. We're seeing these rising floors. We get periods of distribution in a bull and then rising in a bear. Then we get distribution in a bull, rising in a bear. And overall, that rising supply held by long-term holders eventually creates somewhat of a supply squeeze. Now, let's think about what's going on in terms of the issuance. Every day, we're getting 900 coins. If we look at the difference, so what we have here is the long-term holder to issuance ratio. So what we're trying to answer here is relative to the amount of coins that are being mined, fresh coins coming into circulation by miners, how much are long-term holders accumulating and hodling onto? And we're looking at this as some kind of multiple. So for example, if miners are mining 900 coins and long-term holders are accumulating 1,800 coins, then your multiple will be 2x. Then they're holding onto two times the amount of mined coins. If on the other hand, long-term holders are actually spending some and they're only accumulating 450 coins, then they're only accumulating half or 0.5 times the issuance. If they're actually spending and distributing like we saw during bull markets, then they could be spending more than that. Let's say they're spending 900 coins and you would have a negative one on our um, long-term holder to issuance ratio. So what we do is we use the difference function. So difference, M2 is the difference of our long-term holder supply. So we're looking at over the last 30 days, how has this line changed, right? So if we take a value here, what was it like 30 days ago? That's the difference or the change in long-term holder supply. Have they spent coins or have they accumulated coins? And we're dividing that by the same for circulating supply. So what that's saying is if we take any point on this curve and we look back 30 days, how many coins have come into circulation or how much is the circulating supply increase? So what we're now mapping out is how many coins have the long-term holders accumulated relative to issuance over the last 30 days. So what we can see here is this oscillatory behavior. And you can see that when we have these declines in long-term holder supply in the blue, the purple line will also descend into negative territory. That's saying that in this instance, 5.3 minus 5.3, long-term holders are spending 5.3 times more coins than were issued. So we're seeing the issuance come into circulation and long-term holders are spending. Starts to speak about a oversupply or potential that a top is going to be get put in. Now, what we saw during our 2020, 2021, long-term holders we know spent. We can see the long-term holder curve is spent all the way into April. And we actually had an all-time low in this ratio, saying that long-term holders spent 27 times as many coins were mined over the last 30 days. But note that after April, we saw this ratio really start to climb. And it actually peaked at roughly an equivalent level of 27.7 times. So long-term holders back here during this accumulation period at 30,000, they were accumulating 27.7 times more coins than were being mined. So it really goes to show the magnitude just how many of these coins are being hodled and accumulated by these longer term holders. So where we are in, in the current environment, let's zoom in. We can see that we're currently trading at a relatively, and you can see there's a stable gradient. We're increasing at a relatively stable rate, and therefore we have a relatively stable baseline here at somewhere between 13 to 15 times. So if we've got 900 coins being mined, long-term holders are accumulating between 13 and 15 times that many on any particular day, which is quite remarkable. It's showing the strength of just how much accumulation and hodling behavior is going on. So this is a tool that we can really use to provide a baseline, how many coins are coming into circulation, and then we're comparing how much of that is being accumulated and hodled by long-term holders. And when it's greater than one, it's essentially saying that more coins are being taken off the market than are coming back in via issuance. So it's telling us that there is a positive or a constructive supply dynamic that is currently in play. So what we can also see, just to close out our long-term holders and our profitability, is we can see our percent of UTXOs in profit. So this has now risen up to uh, about 96%. So we're seeing a very, very large portion of the market is now in profit. Now, naturally, when people are in profit, it creates two different emotions. One is some people want to actually sell and realize those gains. 
and other people find it much easier to hang on to their coin. So at some point, there's going to be this balance where the incentive to sell starts to grow. And there's also this balance of people going, well, I'm in the green, so I might actually sit tight. So we're in this interesting realm where it's now moving into what would otherwise look like price discovery, where we start seeing that the market approaches this all time high and people start to get excited. And overall, people have to make a decision. Are they going to spend their coins or are they going to actually sit and let the, uh, the overall market play out? So we're going to start seeing these dynamics playing out in the near term. And then we also have our revived supply. So what we're looking at here is the volume of coins that are older than a year, how many of them are coming back into circulation. Now, the reason that this matters is generally if you've held a coin for a year, you're less likely to spend it and you've seen some volatility. So what we're looking for in this particular metric is are we seeing a large amount of these old coins coming back into circulation? So note that during October all the way through to February, we did see this. We saw a very strong trend of old coin volume up to 25,000 coins a day from older hands coming back into circulation. Naturally, this creates serious overhead resistance that the market needs to climb through. Now, we've also seen this significantly decline as the overall topping pattern and then into the May sell-off into July, we saw the quietening down of these older coins and it actually reached very, very low levels, similar to our pre-bull phase. Now we've had a handful of spikes, so a couple of these older coins have come back into circulation, but note how each time it's recovering back down to the lows again. What we're not seeing is a sustained uptrend. So whilst we are seeing some of these older coins come back into circulation that can provide some kind of resistance, it's also not a significant uptrend and that we're not seeing a mass exit by these older term holders. So it's showing that that conviction by and large still remains in the market. Now we're gonna move on and close on with our derivatives market. So we've talked a lot about the spot volumes, the accumulation, what's going on in the on-chain activity. Now there's a whole nother layer to this market which is the derivative space. And this is where leverage comes into it. People can trade futures, hedge risk using options, futures, perpetual swaps. Now in the short term, what can happen with these markets is we see increasing leverage and, and volume coming into these uh, derivatives products. It can create a short term headwind when too many people are leaning on one side of the boat it can sometimes have a short squeeze or a long squeeze uh, that essentially goes against all of that leverage. Now, what I'm seeing when I look at our futures open interest, so this is the number of open contracts, note that we've got a fairly strong climb overall in terms of contracts. Now, this is not necessarily telling us that there's any risk, but it's saying that the likelihood of people having too much leverage is starting to increase. Doesn't necessarily mean there's no absolute value as to what it needs to be to trigger some kind of flush. But what we're essentially seeing is that the probability increases the more leverage is in the system. Now, what we also need to look at, we can see this in our options volume, op um, options open interest as well. So both on the options side and on our futures side, we're starting to get more and more leverage, more speculation, more of these derivative contracts being opened. But now what we have to look at is what's the directionality of that? Are people all going long or is it actually people going short and therefore we could actually see a flush to the upside because normally this leverage will go against where everybody is leaning on one side of the trade. So to do this, we can look at a few different tools. We've got on the left-hand side here, our futures perpetual funding rate, which is the interest rate paid by um, perpetual swap owners. We've also got our annualized rolling basis three months. So three months is roughly into just into the early parts of January, 2021, uh, sorry, January, 2022. What the annualized rolling basis is, is when you're looking at futures contracts, which are currently in a thing called Contango, which is where the future price is trading higher than the current spot price, what that's suggesting is that the market believes there's higher prices in the future. Now, if someone was to buy spot today and sell that futures contract, they can essentially lock in that premium. And that's what we're looking at here is this annualized premium. If you look at, uh, run that trade over the course of 12 months, what's the kind of percent return, return on investment, that a trader can otherwise get from that? Now, what we can see here is that we have a rising annualized basis. Now, what this means is that the premium for futures contracts is starting to rise. It's showing that the market is expecting higher prices in the future, and therefore there is a greater premium that can get locked in. 
Now we can also see our funding rate is slightly positive. It's not super positive like what we saw back in 2020, um, early 2021, but it is elevated. People are net long. So there is a, there is a potential risk in there. Um, it's not huge at the moment, but it does exist and it increases the more open interest and the higher the funding rates tend to go. But we can see from our futures curve that we do have expectations of a higher price. Um, this is up at 14% as a return on investment for traders who are doing this cash and carry type trade. And we can actually distill all of that information down into what's called our futures term structure. So we have futures contracts at November, at December, all the way out to March, and then pushing all the way into this time next year, 2022. And what this is showing you is what the different prices or the market's expectations for where the, the price of Bitcoin is likely to be trading. So when we have this positive sloping curve, it's what we call contango. The future price is higher than the spot price, and therefore traders can buy spot today, sell futures, and essentially lock in that premium. If we're looking at three months out, that would be roughly 14% as a premium. Now, what we can also see is if this starts to curl the other direction, we have a downward slope. It's a thing called backwardation, it's saying that people are expecting lower prices in the future relative to the spot price. That happens less often for most commodities where Bitcoin, it typically trades in contango. However, there are moments in time where it will swap into backwardation and the overall market is expecting lower prices. So the overall read from this is we do have rising open interest and note the rate of change. It's climbing quite quickly across both options and futures. Now, when things are climbing very quickly, when you have a large change in something, it does increase the risk that there's going to be some kind of flush out. But again, there's no guarantees with any of these things. What we're doing is building up what is a potential scenario and preparing for all the different risks and assigning probabilities to them. So our funding rate is, high, is up, but it's not necessarily super high. The market is generally expecting higher prices into the future. So it's telling us something about what the futures market is expecting. There is a potential flush out headwind that's there, but at the moment it's not necessarily as large as it was in previous long squeezes. But again, the, the risk can exist. So that's the overall view for this week. Um, as always, please give us a rate, review, and subscribe. We certainly enjoy having you here, and I, I certainly enjoy making these videos for you. Um, so give us that love, and I will see you in next week's video. Cheers.